What up, YouTube? Patrick here, and it is time to talk about some of the biggest issues with Nano. Shout out to Pavleshka for the topic idea, and I made a note here, you can see on my screen, some of the biggest issues that we're going to cover. So number one is spam. When people hear that Nano has zero transaction fees, they wonder, how can we prevent spam? What's to stop some bad guy from just constantly pounding the network so that real users can't use it? It's a legitimate concern. So there's a couple ways Nano fights this. One is with proof of work on every transaction. Meaning if I want to send you a transaction, I have to generate proof of work with my CPU until it crosses a certain threshold. And then the transaction can be sent with that and the network validates that I've actually done the work. It doesn't really affect me because the wallets pre-compute this proof of work. So as soon as I send a transaction, it computes the work for the next transaction. So anytime I actually wanna send, it's pretty much instant because the proof of work has already been done. How does this stop the spammers? Well, now if you want to create 10 million transactions, you have to compute proof of work for 10 million transactions. Right now, this takes, I think, a few days for 10 million transactions. But of course, that would get easier over time as you have ASICs or GPUs, that kind of thing. Another part of fighting spam in Nano is dynamic proof of work and proof of work prioritization. So now, say, everyone computes proof of work at difficulty one. That's just the base level. An attacker computes 10 million transactions with difficulty one. Now me as a good user, as soon as the network is saturated and it's having issues, I can compute my proof of work with 1.1 difficulty and the nodes will prioritize my transaction over that 10 million transactional spam. They're also researching switching the proof of work algorithm from I think a CPU hard algorithm, which it is today, to a memory hard algorithm which is a lot harder to par parallelize, is that the word? But with that, it becomes a lot harder to spam the network. Number two is privacy, and there's no bones about it. Nano is not private. Just like Bitcoin, it is pseudonymous, not anonymous, meaning there's no names or anything tied to the blockchain, to the block lattice. But if you pay Starbucks with your Nano wallet, they're gonna see, oh, hey, this address has 10 million Nano. Let's go rob this guy. <laughs> just like Bitcoin. The saving grace of this is that second layer solutions can come along and provide some level of privacy. Of course, it's not Monero level of privacy. And for some people, this issue is why they will never use Bitcoin and why they will never use Nano and why they're Monero or Zcash maximalists because it is a big issue. I think that second layer solutions will probably be good enough. Plus, you have some regulatory concerns with privacy coins like Monero. But in theory, you can have second la layer services like mixers or um, even some people use exchanges themselves to provide a level of, of privacy. The third issue that gets brought up a lot is decentralization. So let's pull that up. What does Nano look like right now? If we look at the chart of principal representatives, these are representatives who have more than 0.1% voting weight. So they rebroadcast votes. Anyone can become a representative, but you need 0.1% voting weight delegated to you to rebroadcast your transaction. So these are the main nodes that control consensus and decentralization on the network, the principal representatives. As you can see here, 24% is owned by Binance, which is pretty high. 11% NanoVault, 10% BrainBlocks, 5% from official Nano node, some individual node, who knows who owns that, which is actually kind of cool. Another official node, etc. So the concern here is that if any party or group of parties working together gets over 50% voting weight, then you can control the network. You can double spend, you can do whatever you want. Very similar to Bitcoin and mining hash rate. The good news with Nano is that no party has anywhere close to 50%, and the trend over time has to become more and more decentralized as people move out of exchanges into wallets to different services, etc. Now let's compare this to the Bitcoin mining hash rate you'll see that the chart is actually pretty similar. You got maybe four parties, if they were to collude, would get you over 50%. And with Nano, if you had four parties to collude, it would get you over 50%. In the past, we've actually seen some mining pools come to close to 50% hash rate in Bitcoin. And of course, there's a big, like there's Reddit threads. This was like 2014, 2013, I think, close to when I first got started. And there's Reddit threads and everything. So move your, move your mining out of these these pools and other pools, and that's what happened over time. Nano actually has an additional benefit over Bitcoin in this area because there's no incentive to centralize. Whereas in Bitcoin, you get paid to be a miner, 
So you have an incentive to build an economy of scale to maximize your profit, and that means you get more miners so that you can make more money, and that kind of that's a centralizing force over time. Nano is kind of the opposite. Because you don't earn fees, there's really no reason that you want 24% of the voting weight. It doesn't do anything for you, unless you're actively trying to attack the network and you need 50% for that. Also, a huge point for Nano is that anyone can redelegate their voting weight to anyone at any time. So right now, I could go change my representative to BrainBlocks. I could change it to Nano Foundation. I could change it to Binance. You can't do that exactly with Bitcoin because you rely on miners who control the hash rate to do that for you, essentially. So that's a huge point in favor of Nano, in my opinion. Finally, though, to be fair on this point, Nano could be more centralized. The fact that Binance has 24% voting weight is not good. It's not great. I know they represent many users, but for the good of the network, it would be much better if they only had 0.1% and then the mining, the voting weight went to other nodes so that you eventually had a 1,000 principal representatives with 0.1% voting weight. That would be the ideal distribution. Another issue in this decentralization space, I know I'm kind of going into a rabbit hole, is that you can't have unlimited decentralization. If you had 1 million principal representative nodes, the network would not scale. You would have too much voting traffic going back and forth. You wouldn't have enough network bandwidth to support the network. So there is a limit, and right now that's at 0.1% voting weight. We'll see if that actually works. Maybe it needs to be bumped up. Maybe it needs to be bumped down. But for me, as is, it's pretty good. That's, but that's your call to make. I will acknowledge that this could potentially be a legitimate issue for some people, but I think it's actually better than Bitcoin in a lot of ways. Okay, back to our list. Marketing and adoption. This is a big one, and this could honestly kill Nano. At the end of the day, Nano is a cryptocurrency that needs to be used. If people are not using it, if it's not adopted anywhere... It will die. Why would you hold Nano if you can't use it, if no one recognizes it as a store of value, if the price keeps dropping? There's no point, right? Same with Bitcoin in the early days, though. And look where it is now. Bitcoin did not spend millions and millions on marketing in the early days. It was the enthusiast who got in and said, hey, this decentralized money that I have control over, no one can take from me, and I can spend if I want to, that's what made it powerful. That's how people got in. Of course, over time, that shifted to people want to make money, and the same thing's happening with Nano. That's fine. But this is something to keep an eye on. Uh, I think the developers' plans right now is to get the protocol to where they want it to be. And then after that, I think they're targeting version 20, version 21 maybe right now, to push marketing and adoption as they can. But this is a difficult problem. How do you, what do you spend money on to make people notice this currency, this working product. There are a lot of community initiatives in this space, but uh, it, it will be a challenge. We'll have to keep an eye on this one. Number five is the small developer fund. So here's the total and the max supply of Nano. It's fully distributed. And the developers own 7 million of this, or they did. Now the developer fund is down to 3 million Nano. So really they only have $4 million to pay developers to finish building the protocol and to market. When you consider that one Silicon Valley developer costs a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, and even more if you're paying a niche developer like a cryptocurrency engineer here, that is not going to last very long. Plus, you have all the other Nano Foundation members that do community management, that that run the sites, the hosting fees, all that. That's not a ton of money. I think this will partly be addressed because Colin LeMahieu, the founder of Nano, is building other companies on top of Nano to generate some revenue, like Appia. And also you'll hopefully have um, Brain Blocks, Binance, any big nano exchange that becomes the go-to nano exchange will hopefully eventually do like a Bitcoin foundation style thing where they contribute to the development because it's important to their business. So it's a kind of natural incentive there. I'm not too concerned about this myself because of how close they are to the protocol being pretty solid. Like all the major key features that they need in are pretty much there. Of course, technically development never ends. There will always be improvement. But the goal for Nano is to be an internet RFC. They want to make it like SMTP or IMAP or uh, email where everyone runs their own server and the incentives come from businesses built on top of the layer. It's like TCP IP. Everyone uses it, but no one cares about it. That could potentially be an issue for some people. I think this is a benefit. The fact that they only reserve 5% of Nano 
for themselves for the development fund is way better than almost any other cryptocurrency out there. And they still have 3 million nano left. With some luck, we'll hit a bull market and it will blow up and this will be worth more and development will last longer, but I think we're in a good place right now. Incentives for nodes. So nano has no transaction fees. There's no staking or anything like that. There's no mining. So who runs nodes and why? Well, whales will run nodes to protect their investment. Services run nodes like exchanges and merchant services because they're building businesses on top of that. Because the network itself, the benefits that you get from Nano are the benefits. The cost of consensus or the cost to run a node in Nano is so small compared to the benefits you get, meaning being able to send transactions anywhere in the world for zero transaction fees nearly instantly. That's a huge benefit. And that benefit is so big that it's worth it for businesses to run their own nodes. Instead of paying 2 or 3% in credit card fees, they can pay $50 a month or whatever to run a nano node and save on that 3%, 2%, which is huge as a percentage of their income. And uh, it's a win-win. They're benefiting from the network, they're protecting their investment, and they're saving on credit card fees and things like that. Also, if you are a whale, if you are someone that is following nano heavily, you have a lot of money in nano, you will probably run a node or support a node to keep the network running because that's important to you. Loss aversion. Also, of course, you have the idealists, the, the people who want a green, zero transaction fee, near instant transaction future, money for everyone, don't worry about the government, we have our own money, we have control, people like that will always run nodes. Interestingly enough, there's no incentive to run Bitcoin full nodes, and there are a ton of those. So this is different from a Bitcoin miner who gets paid in transaction fees. Bitcoin full nodes store the, the full Bitcoin ledger. And there's no, they don't get paid for it. There's no incentive for that. And look how many nodes there are now. 10,000 nodes. No smart contracts. So this is a positive or a negative depending on how you look at it. This makes it very hard to integrate Nano into DEXs, decentralized exchanges, because you don't have on-chain smart contracts. But Nano's goal is to be exclusively focused on peer-to-peer -peer value transfer. So me paying you or me paying Starbucks, me paying McDonald's, whatever. Right now, Colin LeMayhew, I think, has said he doesn't see that much real-world use of smart contracts. You could still create code that interacts with Nano. I mean, that's how exchanges work, wallets work, merchant services. They all do code that interacts with Nano. It's just not on the first layer. Another issue with adding smart contracts is that it splits Nano's focus. Right now, it's trying to be the most efficient peer-to-peer -peer value transfer possible. It's cut out everything else to facilitate that goal. As soon as you introduce smart contracts, you have to worry a little bit more about storage. You have to worry about processing. You have to worry about paying people to run these potentially because it makes the cost of consensus a little higher because you're now running code. Um, it impacts scalability because you could have things like CryptoKitties or whatever running on Nano that constantly use the network, and you need to be able to scale for that. The fact that Nano only focuses on peer-to-peer -peer payments makes it a lot easier to scale. And finally is price stability. So this is a weird one, but people always bring up, how is Nano supposed to be a currency if the price fluctuates up and down, up and down? And this was actually the same thing people said about Bitcoin way back and even now. But the thing is, if you have a stable fiat gateway, meaning you can go from dollars to Nano quite easily without any crazy fees, like Coinbase, for example, then this, it doesn't really matter too much. If you spend your Nano, you can immediately buy the current amount of Nano you spent, uh, the current dollar equivalent, and get your Nano back. And then you, it doesn't matter if the price goes up and down. Plus, Nano sends and receives so fast that this is less of an issue. The price is much less likely to change between now and five seconds from now versus between now and 24 hours from now, like sometimes happens in Bitcoin. The other point is, this is a transitional issue. The big vision is that eventually people pay and receive Nano directly. Eventually there'll be enough merchants that accept it, enough people that accept it, that they say, hey, why do we need to go from dollars back and forth? There's so many people that accept this. Let's just spend that directly. And boom, there you go. Also, once you have the idea in theory is that once you have a huge market cap, like the equivalent of US dollars, which would take years and years and many decades if, if we ever see that. But if we get to that point, the price will be a lot more stable because one, everything is priced against the dollar. 
So the dollar, while the dollar may fluctuate, since I'm buying directly in dollars, it doesn't matter. And two, a person with a million dollars can't really move the price of the dollar because the market cap is like trillions. Same thing in theory for nano or Bitcoin in the long future. Uh, one more actually I just thought of is deflation. In nano, the whole supply, the max supply, has been completely distributed. There's no inflation. There's no mining fees. It doesn't increase over the years. There's 133 million, and that's it. And that amount actually decreases over time as people lose their keys, as people send nano to burn addresses for whatever reason, as people die, as people move on from nano. That gets smaller and smaller. <clears throat> This is kind of a, this is more of an economic issue, and there's a much bigger debate on whether or not a deflationary currency can actually work, because uh, I think one of the concerns, like with a gold-backed currency, is a deflationary spiral. Why would people spend their Bitcoin, their gold, their nano now, if they know it's going to be worth twice as much in the future? That could still be the case. We don't quite know. It's, uh, cryptocurrencies are still a little bit experimental. Why this might not be entirely an issue, though, for nano or other cryptocurrencies is that cryptocurrencies are extremely divisible. There are 10 to the 30 raw individual nano units in nano. And since there are no transaction fees in nano, you can use all of those. So even if one nano, this is what everyone buys. Oh, you can't see what I'm pointing at. But <laughs> this one nano, which is what everyone buys on exchanges, is actually 10 to the 30 little raws here. And because there's no transaction fees in nano you can actually use a single raw so even if one of these was worth a million dollars or whatever you could still just send a smaller and smaller amount of nano this little raw also people will always buy what they need instead of forcing people to buy because their money is worth less in the future like that's the case for the dollar now people will buy things they need oh i need to i need to go get gas i need to fill up my electric car actually I need to go buy food. So I don't think being a deflationary cryptocurrency is an issue, but I'm not an economist. I'm not an expert. It could be something to keep an eye on. All right. Well, I know that was a long video, but I hope I covered most of the biggest issues in Nano. I think Nano has good solutions for most of these things. You might not think so. That's perfectly okay. Do your own research. Don't invest because I'm telling you to. If enough people think the same way, Nano will take off. If it turns out these are legitimate issues, then Nano will fail, rightfully as it should. Anyways, that's all I got for you. So as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, let me know. Peace.